Good evening and welcome to session three of the Higher Education History Symposium. I'm Dr. Edwards at Charleston State University and our first presentation is on the history of historically black colleges and universities. So let's take it away. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for being here to hear our presentation today. Uh, as Dr. Edwards said, hey, hello, we're talking about uh, thanks for being historically here black colleges and today. As uh, Dr. Edward said, we are talking about uh, historically black colleges. Oh. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm Alonzo Ellison. I got my Associate of Arts in Music right. from Temple uh, College. So uh, I'm I Alonzo have my Ellison. Bachelor's of Science in Arts Liberal in Studies in from, from Texas a and Central Texas. My and I'm currently working on my Master's in Music Education from Garrett Dalton. I'm a professional musician, and I'm also a trumpet instructor at Georgetown ISD. I'm a professional musician, and I'm also a trumpet instructor. I'm just going to take a break here, just to remind everybody to mute out. Okay. If you're I'm just going to take a break here, just to remind everybody to mute out if you're not speaking at this time. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Emory James. Um, I got my bachelor's of science in kinesiology. And then now I'm pursuing uh, my master's of education in education, educational administration, and I plan to graduate in December. Good evening. My name is Amber Kearney. I have a bachelor's of science in animal science. And I'm currently getting my master's in educational administration, and I'm also currently an agriculture teacher in the Houston area. I plan on graduating in December of 2023. Hello everyone, my name is Malik Miles. Um, I got my bachelor's in communications here at um, Tarleton. Um, right now I am a student development specialist for the Office of Student Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging here at Tarleton State University. And I'm pursuing my master's in higher education leadership. So, um, Right now, we're going to start with the literature view over historically black colleges and universities. Um, so what makes these, what makes HBCUs, as they're commonly known as as well, um, what makes them unique is because of the history of these institutions. I mean, as you see, we kind of have it listed out as past, present, and future. So um, what makes, during the time, as we all learned throughout the class, is that um, higher education started around the early years of um, the American Revolution. Well, with HBCUs, during that time, those African Americans weren't able to attend those institutions. So it wasn't until after um, 1860s where the first HBCU was started, which was Cheney University. Um, as you all see on the slide, the Second Moral Act of 1890, that's when we started to get mandated state um, historical black colleges and universities. Um, these universities were started by the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865. Um, now, currently, what we have with HBCUs now, HBCUs now produce over 20% of all Black college graduates. Um, they're kind of now, the you know, it's mainstream now because of not only just the population, but because of the sports aspect of it as well has made them mainstream now. Um, and most of our Black college graduates who are um, now the, making up the highest population of African American graduates come from HBCUs. Um, where we kind of see HBCUs going now in the future, um, due to the past couple of years of different racial injustices that we've had, and because of the now rising ties of, you know, the rising mainstream presence of athletic sports. Um, historical black colleges and universities are going to see an increase in their enrollment from not only just African American students, um, but other demographics as well, because most of those institutions that we have as far as um, HBCUs are now becoming, um, trying to become more diverse institutions. Um, so pretty much in just reviewing on all the different, you know, research that we did on talking about these topics, um, the HBCUs is not just the institution that makes them up, it's also the culture within those institutions as well. A lot of students that are um, from African-American descent or African-American go to these institutions because of not only the education aspect of it, but the cultural aspect of it and the sense of them feeling, you know, belong, sense of belonging that they feel when they go to these universities. 
All right, so I did observation. So when observing many historical black colleges and universities, so I, did observations. So I had noticed how many culture, historical black colleges and universities, I had noticed how culture, legacy plays a huge role and is very important to many historical black colleges and universities. Plays a huge role and is very important to many historical Sorry, black I keep colleges and universities. Uh, echo. Sorry, someone. Sorry, I keep uh, hearing my uh, echo. Sorry, someone. Sorry. All right, so I mainly focus on two historical black universities near home, which was Prairie View right, so and I mainly focus on two historical black Southern universities University. near home, which was a Prairie few View and College of Holds our diversity, teamwork, a few core and student success. Statistically, black households hold more depth than white households. Um, many, HBUC, many HBCUs try to eliminate this problem by offering tuition at a lower cost. HBCUs was the only resource for Black students who wanted to obtain a degree in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Many influential, influential African-American groups and leaders were products of HBCUs, such as Oprah Winfrey, who studied communications at Tennessee State University. We have doc, Dr. Martin Luther King, who studied at Morehouse in Atlanta, or we have the group, the Tuskegee Airmen, which was a program developed at Tuskegee University who trained black pilots. Today, there are roughly over 107 historical black colleges and universities in the US. HBCUs only make up 3% of American colleges, but they do produce almost 20% of African-American graduates and 25% African-American graduates in STEM fields, which are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. These are really critical industries of the future. When observing my group's discussion, Emory James stated how HBCUs also produce 50% Black educators, teachers, and 70% Black dentists. Not only are historical Black colleges and universities producing Black educators and doctors, they are producing legacies and traditions that are being passed on from generation to generation. Overall, historical Black colleges and universities have had a huge impact for Black students wanting to obtain a uh, education and also make a huge impact on society and culture. So I'm going to pass it on to Alonzo so he can talk about the expert interviews. All right, thank you, Amber. So um, on this section, I'm just kind of going to summarize uh, the different interviews that we were done. The first one was John Lowney, who works at North Carolina a and and is Director of Housing and Residential Life. Uh, he believes that HBCUs provide opportunities for students from low SEC backgrounds HBCUs are actually for everyone. Um, and he also believed that understanding the history of the school provided a clear path to navigate the future. Um, culture, as everyone spoke about, is very, very important. And um, as he stated here, faculty, students, and staff may actually challenge some individuals who bring the same expectations from that they have from um, a public white institution. The next person was Dr. John Robinson who was at Texas Southern University, ex Executive Director of Student Affairs. Um, he stated that HBCUs provide Black students with an opportunity for education at lower tuition costs while maintaining a culture from the past. Uh, he played a large emphasis on the T in Texas Southern uh, standing for teamwork. Um, he believed that history was very important as we need to know that what our ancestors went through to understand where we're, where we're going in the future. Um, he also did not get to attend, uh, did not get to attend an HBCU, and he encourages to get involved with social groups on campus to get the full HBCU experience. So this includes getting into like student leadership groups, uh, fraternities, organizational groups, things like that. The next person was Tatiana Sands, who uh, was the communications director uh, for athletics at Morehouse. She assists the athletic department directly with all of their communication needs. Uh, she believed that history was the most important aspect of a college. And uh, another thing that I really liked about her interview is that uh, she talked about learning if any famous individuals attended your desired HBCU. Uh, so that could help strongly influence where you wanted to go. For example, she used Martin Luther King and Spike Lee um, who went to Morehouse. And then also uh, she placed a heavy emphasis on researching about an HBCU before you attend. And then the last person was Sierra Hoyle, who is a Prairie View a and University alumni. Uh, she was the former captain of the Twirling Thunder, which is the color guard group. Uh, she discussed the importance of walking history at a college. Um, at PV, they had several professors 
um, that were actually there before the band became what they are now. Um, one of the persons that she talked about was Professor Larry Jones. And um, is she talked about the importance of the professors being around from the early stages of the HBCU um, are still able to see what they were able to do, um, how they were able to grow the band from all this harlot's uh, work they did out in the community. Uh, because before uh, PV got to where they are now in the marching band, there was a lot of work with connecting with the community and students to recruit kids from um, inner city schools and along those lines. Um, she also discussed the importance of understanding the culture before entering it into an HBCU. And uh, she also explained how she experienced a culture shock, which I found this to be very interesting. Uh, she went from a small, predominantly, predominantly white town um, of less than 5,000 people to being surrounded by a, a lot of people who looked like her. And uh, it helped her understand the small racial issues that she actually faced in her own band at her school, which is, this is also a common thing I see in my field. Um, I work in music education, but a lot of the um, high school marching bands deem like hip hop music as second class. And I've heard it called ghetto. I've heard them say they don't want to make the school look bad. They don't want to upset the band boosters. So our music is not appreciated <clears throat> very much at the public school level. But once you cross into an HBCU, as you all know, with like Honda Battle, all the bands, um, the music is a pretty big part about a pretty big part of the college experience. Um, so she focused on the heavily, the heavy importance of networking through future, for future work opportunities and also mentorships. So through her mentor and networking, she was able to get her job in marketing that she has now. And she also works part time at three different school districts um, directing the color guard. All right, here's a best practice example one. A best practice example could be many things such as legacy, uh, advocacy, and networking. Uh, advocacy for historical black colleges and universities is very important today. The purpose of advocacy serves as the purpose for alumni, students, faculty, staff, and allies of HBCUs. We'd like students to advocate for equal, uh, equal, equal opportunity for education, working together for lower tuition and fees, advocating for different things such as student education, Pell, land grants or much more. Uh, since the late 1800s, many le black leaders and students have advocated for education, which has led us to 107 historical black colleges and universities today. It is up to us to pass on this torch and continue to advocate, advocate for HBCUs and minority students. So we're gonna go ahead and do the second example. Okay, um, the best practice example um, number two would be um, right now in HBCUs, um, diversity and inclusion is the number one focus because um, there has been a lot of talk whether diversity is destroying HBCUs or not because a lot of non-Black people are attending HBCUs. So like when you're African-American and you get accepted into an HBCU, you already have that idea of being able to relate to people and having that safe space at the, at the institution. Um, as the years go by, we notice that the non-Black enrollment has increased. Um, nearly one fourth of HBCU's population is non-African-American. And um, just for examples, like top two most diverse HBCUs right now, um, Bluefield State um, has a 10.2% of black students um, enrolled right now. And then number two is West Virginia State and it's 11.7% of black people who are enrolled. All right, and I have example three, uh, which has to do with the STEM at uh, Preview. Um, so but being able to make a difference in the world is the goal of any college, but HBCUs place a larger emphasis on this due to students being mostly first generation college students and minorities. When black students graduate, they're often faced with prejudice before even stepping into an interview, such as where you went to school or what your name is. And uh, with voices being louder in organizations such as Black Lives Matter rising up, discrimination has started to be called out more, a lot more frequently. And uh, but despite ongoing discrimination problems, Prairie View has actually managed to consistently produce the highest number of black architects and engineers according to diverse issues in higher education. Okay, um, in conclusion, 
Um, HBCUs provide such a stable environment for the low-income students because they um, they offer so many scholarships and grants. Um, and then also culture is so important within the HBCU industry. Um, they just celebrate like homecomings, Greek life, bands. Um, they just dive into like black history um, and all the meaningful rituals. Um, and that also encourages students to get involved with everything going on in around the campus. Um, and then HBCUs are rooted in faith, community and service. They provide students with great values in life. So knowing the history and understanding the importance of the HBCU before you attend is definitely key. And then also, um, as mentioned before, diversity is playing such a big role in the HBCU today, in today's world. All right, great job. Very excited. Uh, class, what questions do you have for this group? Um, hi, good afternoon. Great presentation, guys. Great job. Um, so I was wondering, because I'm, I'm glad you pointed something out regarding the population of HBCUs, HCB, HBCUs, that you have a mix of people who are non-Black who are attending these institutions these days, and they've, they've been increasing, and uh, not, not like in staggered amounts or staggered rate, but it's been gradually going up. Um, and there is that element of it's affordable for some, but there's some people who actually like wholeheartedly and deep down really want to attend an HBCU. Um, but given that there is that financial crisis that some schools are going through to maintain an all black or predominantly black you know, institution, um, what can, I guess, I guess my question is more along the lines of what can be done to help preserve that culture and history so that way they don't entirely lose that, you know, that part of their identity so that way they're always synonymous as being HBCU versus, hey, you know, we have, we're historically a Black college, but one third of our population is Black because we've had more students who are non-Black coming into the institution because leadership has decided, hey, in order for us to keep the schools operating, we need to get the revenue, we need to get the funding, we need to do this or that, we need to create initiatives that makes appear that we're, yes, we're preserving the culture and the history of, and the dignity of the school, but we need to open up our doors to more people so we can keep the school afloat. So I was just trying to get your take on, on those arguments of what's been going on in certain schools. Um, I guess I can kind of <clears throat> answer that a little bit, um, just because I've been kind of working on that with my job now. Um, how to preserve it pretty much is, you know, keep highlighting it as far as the administration and the students. Um, I know with um, I just went to Langston for maybe like Langston University in Oklahoma, and they're the only HBCU in Oklahoma. Um, went to their homecoming and their history. I mean, they have monuments on their campus. Um, so as you're leaving, you know, your residential hall or you're leaving the student center, you can see the actual history on their campus. Um, and also the different organizations pride themselves on the history of not only, you know, of the organizations on campus, but the university as a whole. Some of their buildings are named after historical people that worked at the school. Um, so even as the diversity grows, um, the historical landmarks and the historical monuments that's on the campus are still there. Um, the, University as a whole, as far as the faculty and the staff have, you know, continue to uphold the, the traditions and the camp, you know, different things that went on on campus. That's what preserves it, like for Tarleton here. Um, Tarleton still carries on some of the traditions that, you know, that was here when it was started. But the, the, the thing is, it's more diverse. And so you have to be able to mm. make it to where it applies to those, you know, to those diverse students as well. Um, so that was pretty much kind of my take on it is not more so of you know the students it's, it's kind of like a whole joint effort the students the university um everyone just continuing to share that history and being prideful you know prideful of the history because each hbcu campus is different as well too culture right. at each camp is different 
I mean, when we think right. about it, I mean, one argument is we could say higher education overall is historically when we think white, about it, I mean, one right? argument is we because say they were founded by European institutions, white. European right. history has backed these schools. And obviously with a lot of things that have come to the forefront with regards to the fact that slaves and indentured servants were used to build the campuses that were the, the earliest versions of the historical buildings that a lot of us know about. Um, you know, think, look at Harvard, right? And they actually have mass graves of, of black slaves built those schools. But then when you think about the institutions that are existing right now, like I remember gone to Hampton in Virginia to visit the campus to do a presentation and to do some recruiting. Beautiful campus overall, but a lot of the buildings were dilapidated, like they didn't have enough funding to like keep the buildings and, and the historical buildings more intact or to modernize them to provide the resources and services that you see at most colleges and universities weren't getting the kind of support and funding. So, you know, there's that part of me is just like, yeah, I understand the business side of wanting to bring in as many students as possible. And yet we're looking at the fact that if you, the systematic issue overall is that students in certain communities, especially students of color, are not getting the support at an earlier stage so they can make it into the HBCUs or to make it into any institution for that matter. And, and they feel like, you know, throwing money is going to help it. And it's not about help just throwing money. It's about investing financially as well as morally in those communities so that way they can get students who want to go to college to get students who want to go to an hbcu or get students who want to pursue different career paths or to i'm sorry i'm kind of on a soapbox right now i apologize but it's just when i think about this sometimes like i just i just feel like there's that business side but there's also like the the, the moral side i feel that we need to address in the sense that the government is not investing as much time or energy in them now luckily kamala harris being vice president is putting a face to it and they've been talking about it a lot there's a lot of talking heads and lip service but i feel like there needs to be a lot more to be done for those institutions to support them and to maintain their their not just the physical structure but just the historical aspect of it and to respect it and to keep it in perpetuity just like for all other institutions that exist right now so sorry my little soapbox i apologize everyone <laughs> Hi, I have a question. This is Karen. So um, in light of, I guess, more current events um, going on and Deion Sanders leaving, um, you know, Jackson State um, and people saying that, you know, his um, departure will actually, you know, um, negatively affect what H H HBCUs have um, within, I guess, the last year or so of him being a head coach um, at that university. Um, was what it was intended to do. And now him leaving for a bigger D1, um, you know, not HBCU uh, university. What do you got? What, what's your take on that? And um, I guess from the sports side of um, all of the, this current events going on. I think um, with Deion Sanders, the most important thing to remember is that um like the phrase that and then there was one and what he did um was put you know a lot of, in my opinion he put a lot of pressure on um black retired athletes to give back to the students to give back to the community so they have a face to tie with what they're doing they have a voice to tie with what they're doing and you know it is unfortunate that he you know he's leaving but he has a career he has a life he has a family so I think being understanding of that and just knowing like, hey, he paved the way and um, hopefully it will inspire more um, retired black athletes to step forward into more coaching positions inside of HBCUs. I know that's a problem that we have inside the fine arts sector. We literally have like we don't have a Deion Sanders at all. So a lot of fine arts programs at HBCUs are actually suffering like a lot. Enrollment is very low. Um, and students are opting to go to um, PWIs um, simply because they just get a better scholarship deal. And then uh, in turn, a lot of the um, students and the music departments at HBCUs are actually non-music majors. So that's not good for the school as well. So I think overall, those kind of organizations like athletics, fine arts and things like that, they just need you know, more Deion Sanderson's to show up and um, 
help really just put HBCUs back on the map uh, because until he really put it, put, uh, put HBCUs back on the map, I mean, they were still thought of, you know, as kind of like second class universities. And so a lot of the, the students, that, a lot of black kids that, for instance, would normally go to D1 actually put their talents to an HBCU for the first time in a while. And so I think what's going to happen is we're just going to see more of that. And um, but like I said, the coaching, the coaching aspect, like I said, it's unfortunate, but hey, he has a career, he has a life, a family, but he's already created a legacy just by being the first one to step up and do something, in my opinion, on that. So. Yeah, that's very interesting you bring that up. I mean, it is some of this news that, you know, people are talking about. Uh, I know at Tarleton, you know, I, students may not really see it much, but from faculty and staff standpoint, uh, they're, the way colleges are organized, you know, there's a lot of them are organized based on their research. And R1 is sort of the top tier and Tarleton just got into R2 status. Uh, and, and what many people may not know is that uh, Jackson State has been R2 for many, many years. So they were actually R2 before we were. Um, and uh, when Tarleton got in that list, I believe uh, Prairie View got on the list as well. Um, and so, uh, and Prairie View's had some, you know, like we had our, we just got AACSB accreditation for our College of Business and they've had it for many years. Um, and so I think sometimes we always have this perception for institutions that, you know, they are lesser institutions and that's not always the case. They may be lesser in terms of athletic funding or lesser in terms of number of students, um, but a lot of it is perception. Um, and so, you know, those are things that we have to think about in terms of how we how we evaluate institutions. So when you all mentioned doing your research, uh, it is important, you know, to pick those institutions that are in line. I know I was a, a biomedical science major in college. And, you know, the, 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 when I was trying to figure out where I was going to go to graduate school, um, people, the schools, they were looking for students from, from Xavier in Louisiana. Uh, they were looking for students from Morehouse. I mean, it, and it, it wasn't, I didn't take that as an offense. It's just the reality is those schools had a, had a reputation for producing top students in biomedical science. Um, and so it's just, it depends on what field you're into. Uh, different schools are, you know, at Prairie View is really known for engineering as you all, and architecture as you all mentioned. Uh, but yeah, great schools. Um, and uh, just wanted to ask you as a final question, in terms of this process, whether it's information or whether it was just process of learning about the history of these institutions or how to research institutions, what are you going to take with you from this class? Uh, for me, uh, what I'm most to take from this class. Um, for me, personally, it was this kind of social media. Uh, what I'm most to take from this class. Is understanding the importance you should be able to go now Malik go ahead Malik hey Malik oh okay I, I I guess I got a little delay on my end um but for um for me personally um just kind of looking at it from from HBCU standpoints because I kind of my I kind of grew up learning you know hearing about them because my dad went there um went to one and um but what I could kind of take away pretty much is the importance of the history of these institutions um specifically from the HBCU standpoint of it um the history matters um the, the history is, is something that pretty much all of the students know um versus with me you know coming through my undergraduate through through a pwi you know some of the students may know about the history of the institution some of the students may know about the tradition or the culture of the campus but at an hbcu everybody knows the staff the faculty um the you know the students everybody knows where this is you know where this institution started how you know how this institution came to be um and everybody's pretty much full-fledged involved, whether it's in the different fraternities and sororities, 
and organizations. Um, and so for me, kind of coming out of this class, it, you know, when I go and I visit different, you know, universities, um, because eventually I want to work at an HBCU. That's that's kind of you know a goal of mine. I want to eventually go and work in one. So leave, you know, taking away from this class, you know, just understanding the history of these organizations and of these institutions, and not just certain institutions, but these institutions as a whole, why they existed, you know, the history behind why we even have an HBCU and why it's, you know, it should be that everybody should be able to go and attend a higher institution, a higher level, a higher education school but why there had to be different institutions for different reasons for HBCU and HSI or MSI. So that's kind of some of the things I took away from the class. Yeah, I would agree with Malik, um, just understanding um, the importance. Yeah, I would agree. Oh, sorry. Understanding the importance of an HBCU and understanding like why the culture is so strong when you attend there. Um, just speaking to a faculty like, a faculty member there she was just the way she was talking about the HBCU you could tell that she had passion in her voice and she was like diehard for Morehouse so just understanding like the importance of the history and stuff like that Alonzo, did you get your? And then, yeah, I also, also agree, you know, with my, uh, okay. first, you oh. know, legacy is very important. Like Malik said that his dad went to HBCU, my dad went to Prairie View. So legacy was very important. You know, we teach that to all of my family members about historical black colleges. We teach them tradition and, you know, culture and spirit. And that just really passed on to generation to generation. Uh, PV has a saying that, you know, you pass on the torch, you know, pass on that information, never forget, you know, what our ancestors went through. And uh, that's just how we, you know, keep the legacy alive. Uh, so yeah, I started out talking about the importance of um, the history of a university uh, before doing this, project I really I'll be honest I've never looked at the history of any school that I have went to uh, I haven't read anything about it I haven't felt inclined to read about it or anything but after doing this I'm seeing like I guess Malik say you know people on HBCU campuses all my friends that went to HBCUs they can tell me who found it what who was the first pioneer of their department um, everything they can tell me everything about the HBCU and to me at the time it was just like oh you know they just know about their school I didn't take that as like how prideful they are to be there and um, for me like I'm a first generation college student like nobody actually I'm the first person in my entire family on both sides to go to college and um, that's all everyone was like you need to go to an HBCU you need to go to an HBCU and I actually had a scholarship offer to go when I graduated high school to be at Crivview in the band and I actually turned it down because of what I perceived an HBCU was versus what it actually is like I was you know I was getting my band directors were like oh you don't want to go there like you want to go to this other school and they have more access to better instruction and blah 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 and <clears throat> at the time I didn't <clears throat> I didn't realize like that was actually like hardcore discrimination. Uh, so I went to a school that was predominantly white. Like I think in my in my class we graduated eighty seven people, and out of those eighty seven, only about uh, maybe six of us, seven of us were uh, black students. And so um, only out of that group, only one of us went to an HBCU, and they actually caught a lot of um, negativity for going to an HBCU from our peers, but our community was like really excited that they went to the HBCU. So with the HBCUs, I'm saying the importance of community and uh, the importance of history and the importance of uh, really just being immersing yourself in your culture and learning the history of your culture. Because I think often we forget as African American students that, you know, there was once upon a time, like we couldn't really go to school. Like there was a time we couldn't go to school, learn a lot of these institutions. And so that's really put the um, HBCUs in a completely different light for me. And um, now I'm hoping at some point during my teaching career to be able to work at an HBCU, whether it's like a summer music camp or 
um, just being like an adjunct in the music department or just anything. I feel like I owe it to uh, young black students because I've had young black students over the years. I'm in year 14 of being a trumpet instructor. So I feel like I owe it to my community and I owe it to um, those who come after me to at least attempt to try to work in an HBCU. And um, so I really enjoy learning about them. Like I said, I came into this. I did not attend one. I didn't know anything about one. So I'm really excited to to go forward and continue to learn more about more HBCUs. So I'm hoping to be able to visit some campuses over the summer just to really get an idea of what the culture was. Because I never did fraternities or like anything like that. So um, all my HBCU friends are heavy into fraternities. They're heavy into you know, universal family and you're heavy into community. And uh, now I'm really able to respect that aspect of them a whole lot more than what I was before. Great job. I'm, I'm excited. This was a great presentation. And uh, we'll, you know, it was a really powerful way to learn more about historically Black colleges and universities. Professor, do you mind if I share one last thing very quickly? No problem, John. I'll, I'll keep it within a minute, really. Um, one of the challenges I'm dealing with right now at SMU is getting a lot of our faculty and staff to recruit faculty who are coming from the HBCUs. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of like was on my soapbox or I apologize if I might have turned some people off, but I think one of the things that we need to recognize and appreciate what these diverse faculty members who are studying exactly the same things. And like you said, Dr. Edwards, some of these institutions are R2. Uh, there's, and some of these schools just want people from R1 institutions, but that does not necessarily mean that these candidates from R2 institutions do not have something valuable to share or to bring to the campus community to make it better. So, um, you know, for all of us who are out there, you know, if you have colleagues, please encourage them to widen or broaden their canvas in terms of hiring and providing opportunities to you know, students, graduate students, faculty members who are who are working in those institutions. They deserve every opportunity to share what they're doing in the classroom at all institutions across the board. Thank you. All right, couldn't say it better myself. All right, great presentation.